Business on Board. I'm your host, Kerry Herford Jones, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you on board as I meet up with a wonderful variety of guests who are all connected in some way, shape, or form to the marine world. I'm with Captain John Kidd for today's podcast. John, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for having me. John, just if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself to us. A, a sort of a one-minute overview, if you will, condensed <laughs> as to who you are. Of course, yeah. Uh, so I'm Captain John Kidd, Cows Harbour Master, work for Cows Harbour Commission. I've had about 30 years in the marine industry now, both shoreside and afloat. I've had about five years of command of different types of vessels, from dredges to boy tenders. Within that time, John, a yeah. variety of different craft have been under your command. Give us, a, give us a taste of some of the things that you've actually had command of. So my first command was a, a small multi-cap vessel, 25 by 10. She was a boy tender and plough dredger, the UKD Sea Lion. For a company called UK Dredging, part of ABP. I was asked to look after it for two weeks and ended up there for two and a half years. Did some really interesting contracts with her at Southern Ireland when I did some boy work and dredging in Waterford. And then we did some work with a bigger dredging company, Boscalis, over in northern France. So we did some work for the new container terminal at Calais. But yeah, really interesting work. I've had a year in command of the THV Alert for Trinity House. During that time aboard Alert, I was become known as the the bomb master so in 500 and odd years of trinity house i was the first commander to have a a world war ii bomb come up on top of a sinker so a sinker is what connects the, a boy to the seabed then there's a riser chain then the boy on the top so it's about a, a, a meter square of steel a big steel lump perched on the top of a little pile of sand was a, an 80 20 pencil bomb so we had to sit for five hours off Oldborough, just north of Felixstowe, while the explosive department came up from Portsmouth under blue lights, five hours on the motorway at blue lights, to come out and blow up the bomb. Um, you, you say that now with, <laughs> with a sincere of, you know, kind of, oh, it's just one of those things. But that yeah. must have been terrifying. Uh, well, having worked on dredges, we were quite used to having dredged ordnance on board, but there were set procedures to deal with that. I'd never had it or heard of it in Trinity House. It was Trinity Sunday, so ringing up the office, they were all in church, didn't answer the phone, so we were on our own. Harwich wouldn't let us back into the port with this thing strapped alongside. So well, we I'm to wait. say I'm not surprised, John, <laughs> to be fair. So yeah, it was an interesting few hours waiting. Me and the chief engineer managed to get over the sides and lash this thing down with a, a ratchet strap very, very carefully. Because <laughs> the, the last thing we wanted it to do was to, to hit the vessel side and, and cause any sort of damage. So... Once the EOD got on board, the RNLI brought them out. The first thing they did, got it on deck and got out a little chipping hammer and started tapping away at it. We're all petrified. But they said, well, it's all right. It's been sat on the seabed for 40 years. It's fine. I wish we'd known that five hours earlier. And they they discovered what it was. They took it about 500 metres away, strapped some C4 to it, blew it up. Uh, and we had fresh cod for dinner that night, which was fantastic. <laughs> Every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> exactly, yes. My next command came when I joined Red Funnel. So I had two years in command of the 95-metre car ferries that come in and out of cows over to Southampton. And back. So you've seen it from every perspective. You've been in and out of this harbour. You know this harbour pretty well. Pretty well. I've also been a pilot here for, for the last eight years, so bringing all the commercial ships in and out, tugs, springing in sort of bulk cargoes. Um, we did a... A special cargo came in a few years ago, so we had two big Rolls-Royce generator engines brought in for the tomato farm out in Arriton. So that was the largest vessel ever to visit cows at 110 metres. And you were the pilot? I was the trainee pilot on that. I had uh, Captain Rod Hodgson with me at the time, but yeah, the two of us did that act together. And because of the size of it, the swinging basin is 135 metres, so we had a, a small tug either end to help turn the vessel. She couldn't take the bottom, so we had to come in at the top of a spring high water get one engine off then take a back out to anchor and then back in the next day for the next one so a a real real operation you you earned your beer in the bar afterwards definitely yeah (laughs) Yeah. so john just give us a flavor if you will as to the roles and responsibilities then of the cow's harbour master so it's the the ultimate aim and the ultimate role for the harbour master is is overall safety of all the operations on the water so whether it be piloting visiting vessels dredging it's it, it all comes back to me so cow's harbour is a trust port and it's set up so we've got a board of trustees they're the duty holder so ultimately the buck stops with them they employ a a competent harbour master to act on their behalf and make sure that everything's done safely so I fulfil that role for them part of that role and when we look at all the powers that we've got in the harbour in 2012 we did a a harbour revision order which changed our our powers from bylaws which are very very difficult to update because it takes an act of parliament to what's called general directions 
So these act in exactly the same way as a bylaw. It, it gives us powers for all sorts of things, so we can control and regulate the, the passage of vessels in and out of Cows Harbour to make it as safe as possible, really. And how long have you been in post now? It's it's a it's a been a long time. I've got a few more grey hairs, but it's uh, six weeks. <laughs> six weeks. <laughs> well, it's lovely to be able to talk to you six weeks into into your new role. The first yeah. question has to be though, of course, is are you enjoying yourself? Very much so. So I, I was at Cows Harbour before. I did four years as Deputy Harbour Master before taking a bit of time back in the marine industry to to gather a bit more experience and knowledge before coming back into this this very important role. But it's yeah, it's great. It's it's very very challenging. My previous role. Whilst very, very important for the safety of mariners with Trinity House, left a little bit to be desired in the terms of self-satisfaction. I, I like a challenge. I like to pick up a project, see it through and, and come out with a good result. That last job didn't quite give me that. So coming back here and having about 60 different plates spinning all at once, you have to have, wear many, many different hats. As you can imagine, Cows is a very busy place from not only the leisure industry, commercial industry, ferries... Uh, dredging you, you know, name it you name it it happens <laughs> in cows and of course we, you know with a gateway from the island to the Solent as well and and as those of you that, that know the Solent it's a very very busy place particularly in the summer so cows plays a quite a, a vital role in that uh, and, and the, the overall safety of, of you know those activities let's talk a little bit more about those plates that you end up spinning what sort of things go on in your normal week like so so let's just run through last week as an example so monday we have a, a monthly management meeting so all the site managers and our ceo gary get together and, and have a look at what's happened in the last month from terms of safety any accident incidents they need to be aware of any works in the harbor that's coming on dredging which we've got a big campaign coming up soon i keep mentioning dredging but it's, it's quite an important thing it's on the tongue of of most sailors in cows they like to better get their bigger yachts in and out of the marina safely yeah. so as well as all the safety aspects we then look at the businesses so as a trust port we run several businesses to support the harbour okay. and, and all the money that's earned from those businesses gets put directly back into the harbour for future v- developments future safety projects all that sort of stuff uh, so it's sort of you know, self-perpetuating if you like the more money we earn the better we can make the harbour i know people have concerns about harbour dues and and mooring fees etc but it, it doesn't go to waste it's not being split out to shareholders it all comes back into the harbour so it's quite an important process really and, and i think it's the best way to run a harbour because the people that are running it have a, a real interest in in continuing that sort of safety message and you know making sure we're still here and still safe and still operating in 100 years time so it's it's a great way to do it i think and during um, that week do you get out on the water as well I, I do so we had we've got two new seasonal patrol offers that we, we bring on for the summer months to help with the busy periods so i was out having a, a little harbour tour with them a little tour of the estate to show them what's what and who's who and what pontoons to watch out for for some interesting characters how to deal with the ferries when they're coming in the red jets when they're turning all, all that sort of stuff so yeah had a couple of hours out on the water so that was the monday afternoon so gone from meeting and, and big sort of strategic stuff to to then dealing with staff and, and out on the water being a physical presence in the harbour we're working on a big emergency exercise that's going to be post-season because we're all a little bit busy up until that point. But we're going to be simulating a, an EV fire on one of the Red Funnel ferries, which is a hot topic at the minute. Yep. So we'll have Coast Guard, police, fire, ambulance service, local council, all the resilience officers, Coast Guard, all involved in that so that should it ever happen, we'll, we'll all have a, a little bit of practice and know roughly what we can and can't do to keep people safe in the harbour. I was then out uh, piloting, so we've got a, a regular visitor, the city of Chichester, she's a, a 72 metre dredger that comes in and out. She currently normally runs under a, a pilot exemption certificate, but that master's on leave, so they've got a temporary guy in, so that means that one of our cows pilots has to go out, bring the vessel in, and then take it back out again three and a half hours later. That was quite a late night for me, that one. Thursday, I was over onto the mainland, doing a, uh, having a meeting with ABP, so our pilots because of the the shape of our area and the shape of cows sorry the southampton area we we just sort of border each other so the competent harbour authorities you know meet meet each other in order to bring a ship into cows we have to bring it through, through southampton's area so all our pilots have to be authorized by abp so we had to have a a, a bit of a meeting on how we're going to reshape that in the future so for any pilots coming in in training to be a cows pilot are going to have to then do some extra training with with southampton so that was that was a, a again another sort of high level meeting and then back dealing with we've got a bit of a project to try and improve safety and navigation at night in cows so i've noticed certainly from a pilot's point of view that there's a couple of dark areas that could maybe do some extra navigation lights 
So working with our port engineer on going out to get some quotes, figuring out exactly what we need, where we want it, how we're going to make it work. And then Friday we had a visit from a company that's looking to buy one of our, our older boats. We're looking to sell that on, so a bit of a salesman role as well. So it, as, as you said, you know, a variety, and it, and that's what keeps me going, really. Fantastic. Lovely to hear. Thank you for telling us no all problem. about that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always, I find, insightful, it, not just into the role or into the person, but also into how you fit into the whole thing. Let's look at some of the issues that, that happen within cows, because this always seems to me having sailed in and out of here for so many years one of the busiest ports around would you agree with that we're certainly up there in terms of leisure but it's the mix that really makes it as as busy as it is you know we've got you know the car ferries coming in eight times a day we've got the the red jets coming in maybe 12 times a day we've then got commercial shipping we've got small leisure boats We've got tourist boats with solar and white line cruises. And then on top of that, you've got the sailors. We've got the training academies with UKSA with their little ducklings that they tow around. It, it's a busy place. In the peak of summer, we've got maybe 10,000 movements in a day. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, it's, that's a lot of boats it, moving around. And yeah. the chain ferry then clanking back and Absolutely, forth in the middle yeah. of the river. What are the sort of things you come across or see or hear about that you think that we can learn from this? So the main thing and the main drive for us at the moment, one of our biggest incident responses is to people with propulsion failure. So they'll break down in the middle of the harbour, the ferry's coming in, tooting five short and rapids, please get out of the way. I can't, my engine's broken. It's about getting boat owners particularly in the leisure world to just check their boat is up together uh, and fit fit for purpose really what tends to happen that will be the first sort of outings after the winter people will pop the boats in yeah it it was fine when i stored it the the fuel will still be fine even though it's been sat there for six months they get 10 minutes down the road and things start overheating running out of fuel the fuel filter's clogged the alternator breaks down the belt pops off it's those sort of things that we would really really like to drive home the message to people that it's in your interest to check your boat is safe make sure you've got enough fuel make sure your engine's up together you've serviced it before you go out because the last thing you want to do is get mid solent and get run over by a big container ship because your engine's broken down and nobody can get to you in time so it's really important to make those pre-departure checks if you like and the tide runs fairly strongly down the Medina. yeah yeah spring ebb tide at the chain ferry you can get close to four knots if not over particularly if you've got a southwesterly wind as well and it's held the tide up and then all of a sudden it comes out in a rush so obviously we, we keep a risk assessment register of all the navigational hazards in cows. We can send out messages, notice to mariners, put signs up, but it's the chain ferry. As as we just mentioned, the four knot tides, spring ebb tides, people forget how far their boat will travel when they stop the engine. The chain ferry has right of way under our general directions, unless it's pre-arranged. So you can call up the chain ferry and, and ask for permission for them to wait so that you can go through. That's in our general directions, GD number six, for those that want to look it up. But if you haven't called the chain ferry and asked them to, to wait for you to come through, you need to stop and, and make sure that you can turn around and stem the tide until they're clear. We've had so many boats either pinned against the side of the chain ferry, hit the chains, and it causes an awful lot of damage, and it's very, very embarrassing for those that are involved. So if you want to avoid the embarrassment, just be aware of the tide, what it can do, uh, and turn early. And Uh, and risk of life, of course, at the end of the day. Absolutely. The last thing we want in cows is something where somebody is injured, or even worse. I've been in command on one of the Red Funnel ferries, People have managed to squeeze through the chain ferry on an ebb tide, forgotten all about the ferry and how you get set onto it. And we've had vessels pinned alongside that physically can't do anything. They're starting to get pushed under. We've had to go down and put lines on it to keep the boat from disappearing while we're waiting for HM1 or or somebody else with a, a big powerful rib to come and rescue them. There's very little we can do on the ferry other than stand and watch and, and try and offer some support. We're turning some pretty serious stuff here, aren't we? This is fundamentally a risk to life and limb if you get it wrong and you can get yeah. it wrong it's so easy and it happens so quickly it, it, it does you're absolutely right but the information is is out there there's an awful lot of information on our website that will tell you all about the tides we put out local notices to mariners every year to highlight these things particularly to do with a chain ferry it's a dangerous stretch of water if yeah. you get it wrong there are things that boat owners could do to help themselves to help you to to make things easier yeah. and i'm presuming i'm thinking now about the around the island race and i'm thinking now about cows week all those issues you get throughout the normal year all concentrate into one or two weeks it's crazy if you looked at it from a risk assessment point of view you probably wouldn't do it luckily unluckily for us the event organizers are those that hold the risk they are the duty holders for keeping their competitors safe 
there's lots of systems in place before these events so already now we're talking to cows week about their risk assessment they submit it to us as the harbour authority we look through that with a, a fine tooth comb to make sure that they've assessed all the risks properly and have all the right control measures in place We've got about 480 boats planning to to enter this year, as far as we're aware. So it's a bit of a quieter year, but the the risks when racing, as you you may well appreciate, are, are quite high. There's there's a lot that can go wrong when you're out racing, particularly when people are focused on on their own boat and not aware of what else is going on around them. You chuck into the mix commercial vessels that have the right of way around that prohibited area off off cows up around Bramble Turn and into Southampton. You know, anything over 220 metres, if you get in the way, somebody's going to come and toot the horn and, and get very cross at you. And a few years ago, somebody got that wrong with the Hannah Nutson. From a risk point of view, we, we help the, the clubs, the organisers, just fine-tune those risk assessments and we help support them in, in any way we can without committing ourselves too much because we still need to look after the harbour itself yeah. and not necessarily what's happening out in the Solent. So the, as, as part of that process, we'll have a representative down on the, the squadron for Cows Week particularly and around the island. So there is a, a bit of a liaison between the assets in the port. So our, our patrol ribs will also have a look at the ferries coming in and out and speak to the ferries directly. There's normally a, a red funnel rep there as well, and we can liaise through them to make sure that the timings are such that hopefully the ferry doesn't come across the start line just as a fleet of boats are setting off. doesn't yeah. always work, yeah. but we try and deconflict as much as we can to keep the racing safe yeah. and, and enjoyable for the competitors. And recognising that there are two sides to the story here and there are two groups of people here that both need to be satisfied if at all possible. Yes, it's a difficult one to manage, but the event organisers are very well practised at, at those events. Mm. Occasionally it, it does go a bit wrong, but... We'll investigate those incidents as the Harbour Authority and, and try and learn whatever we can yeah. and then help the event organisers, the clubs, to, to make things better and safer f- for those people taking part. So when we get the phone call from the United Nations needing you for the next ambassador, we, <laughs> we'll pass it straight through to you. Absolutely, yeah, I'll just add it to the list of jobs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk now a little bit about the, the physicality of, of the harbour. Uh, and the first thing that strikes anybody coming here that hasn't perhaps been here for you know, a decade is that massive breakwater out there. A couple of things, first of all, what, why was that built? What was the background to that? And what impact has it had in general terms to, to Cowes Harbour? Okay, so everyone thinks it was a new project, but it actually dates back to the the late 1890s. We've got some of the original drawings up in the Harbour Office, which are fascinating. For a breakwater in that position, slightly longer, so it predates the the old straight breakwater that that runs out of East Cowes. And it was to try and protect the harbour from from northerly and and northeasterly winds, uh, which blow right into the mouth of the Medina. Um, So it wasn't a new idea, but... There was the, the the old breakwater now that runs out of East Cows to protect from some of the tidal effects on particularly the ebb tide running across the, the harbour entrance. But in the early sort of mid 2000s, Stuart McIntosh, who was the harbour master at the time, put quite a lot of time and effort and money into fulfilling this dream really of having a, a fully protected harbour. So it, the idea really is to protect the smaller outer harbour moorings where the day boats tend to be from northerly and northeasterly winds. It's had some interesting effects in the harbour. If you talk to anyone from the Island Sailing Club, anything from the northeast funnels through that tiny gap between the breakwaters straight onto their pontoon, making it very uncomfortable for, for people there. Not ideal. And the last talk I did at the Island Sailing Club, they asked, are you ever going to close that gap? No. We can't, really. <laughs> we can't. The tidal effects is the one that really stands out in people's minds and you, you see the physical effects of, of what the changes to the tides have, uh, have occurred when you're out particularly about two hours before a spring high water you'll probably be aware of the the strange sort of tidal anomaly around the isle of Wight, where the flood tide comes up from the west we get it up the solent sort of through the needles channel and, and flooding from the west at the same time it's going around the south of the island and then tries to flood from the east filling in that sort of hole in the middle so we get that high water stand for about two hours at southampton and, and cows but the effect that that has is you get a, sort of a fake ebb off the entrance, and let's say about two and a half to two hours before high water, mm. particularly noticeable on the spring tides. You'll notice just off the breakwater, right at the, the mouth of the, the, the sort of main fairway, you'll get an ebb tide starting quite strong, and then it will work its way out, sort of overriding the, the flood tide from the west. So bringing a, a ship in or a, a, a yacht, you'll be pointing 
sort of down towards the west, stemming the tide, crabbing your way in, and then within a matter of about five metres, it'll completely flip from the other direction because it runs just about east-west there. If you don't know it's happening, it can be a real shock, and you can suddenly find yourself getting down, set down towards the squadron. Um, so it's something to be aware of when you're visiting cows, but that breakwater has accentuated it a little bit, whereby it's deflecting the tide to the north of the breakwater, so you, you get it a little bit more prominently just at one and two boy until that rear lead kicks in. But that gap between the new breakwater and the old breakwater allows that sort of fake ebb to funnel through and straight down the eastern small boat channel. And about by between 4A and 4, you'll get a, a cross tide. And it can be on a good spring tide, it can be up to about two knots. And it, it does a very, very strange thing. There's a brilliant video on our website that shows exactly what the tide does when it comes into an entrance because it bounces off just by the red jet and then sort of does a, a gyre around in both directions. So it splits. So you get some running out to the entrance, some running down towards the, the bigger car ferry. It bounces off and you end up with a, a sort of circular motion. So if you're bringing a big ship in from at that state of the tide, from in between one and two, You'll have that, that weird flip-flop of tide at the entrance that you have to be aware of. There's a, a tidal shadow just to the west of the end of the breakwater, so your bow comes into dead water, your stern's still out in a fake ebb tide. So it's trying to sort of turning you to port into the, the main harbour moorings, very, very shallow there, don't want to be there. You're then coming into this cross current, which is trying to put you onto the red jet terminal. A little bit further down, you then get this weird sort of back eddy that's trying to put you onto number six and boy and the big car ferry. And then you've got a chain ferry to, to deal with as well. So it's very, very tricky. And for it's those just... that don't know it, it, yeah. it can catch you out. And chuck into the mix, it's Cows Week, and we've got 500 yachts all coming out to try and race, and you're trying to come in. Yeah, we, we try and deconflict that as much as possible. We'll, uh, we'll put off the commercial ships, but Red Funnel still need to get in, yeah. run a timetable, so it, it, it's tricky. So from the bridge of, uh, of a ferry or from the bridge of a dredger, uh, how, how does that look to you when you're looking down at us in, in a small sailing boat? <laughs> Cow's Harbour's a very small place when you're on a ship. With the, the widest point of the fairway is only about 85 metres, the narrowest is about 60 metres. So when you're on a ship that's 95 metres long and 15 metres wide and you're 40 foot up in the air, looking down on a, a little boat that's coming towards you, you suddenly lose sight of it very, very quickly. And all you can see is maybe the top of a mast. That's quite disconcerting because although you hope they know what they're doing and they've seen you, it's not always the case. You need to think, certainly on a bigger ship, a, a long way ahead. Uh, for the commercial ships that come in and out of cows, we, we run the pilot boat ahead of us to try and sort of gently nudge people out of the way without that service it, it would be very very difficult having been captain at red funnel and bringing some of the, the big raptors in and out the number of times where you've had to take the speed off shoot five short and rapids it, it happens more often than you would like and it, it really focuses your mind the people on the the yachts sort of look behind them it's, it tends to be people going away people particularly on yachts tend to forget to look behind them to see what's see what's coming up and it's normally those that look round and see the bow of a 95 metre ferry bearing down on them and, and there's panic then. So it's, it, it, yeah, it, it's interesting from that size. Thinking ahead and knowing what's coming is, is, is part of our sort of bread and butter. We, we're aware of it, but it's those that are on the other vessels that aren't aware of it. That's the real issue. And you can't always guarantee what they're going to do. There is yeah. that kind of, oh my goodness me, you know, <clears throat> explosive, explosive, <laughs> what do I do next? Uh, and really yeah. what you're saying is, is get into shallow water. And we talked earlier about, of course, about how shallow that actually is where the small boats are. That is pretty shallow in there. Nothing's really going to damage you or get to you if you can get in there okay. Certainly up to the, the eastern channel from the chain ferry, there, there is plenty of water outside the main channel. So mm. if you can, just avoid that risk. It, it is safe. Uh, the boats are floating there. If if they can float, unless you've got a, a serious keel underneath you, you can also float. And yeah. it, it's, it's better just to get out of the way if you can and if it's safe to do so. The environment high on the Cows Harbour Authority's list of actions now. What's yep. what's on the plan? What's next for you to look at and to try and improve in terms of the harbour? We're a little bit limited in what we can do, but there, there are certainly things that we're looking at. And we've got our overarching strategic plan. A big part, which everyone's trying to do, is become carbon neutral. So we're looking at many different schemes. So the solarisation of the Kingston boatyard. We've got some big buildings up there. The roofs are ideally to house solar panels. We're actually hoping that if we can get all that sort of signed off, obviously it costs a little bit of money, but as I said before, all the mooring fees and harbour dues that come in go towards projects like that. But if we can get that signed off, we're actually hoping to become carbon positive, whereby we can generate more 
power than the site is using and we can then feed that back into the grid and the structure on the island if we can. Other things that we're doing from an environmental point of view, dredging it's an ongoing issue in cows. You know, people historically have, have dug big ditches and, and turned them into marinas out of what was naturally salt marshes and, and muddy banks. Nature will always want to fill them back in again, so it, it's it, it's a task that will that will certainly outsee my lifetime. They'll always be dredging, but what we're looking at doing is using some of that dredge material to rebuild some of the salt marshes down towards the folly. So these have been eroding over many many years, and it's it's a really important habitat. We we've got triple S I classification, so that's a, a site of you know, special scientific interest. There's there's some sort of reasonably rare breeds that that live down there, particularly plants and animals. So we're hoping to, if we can get the approval from the MMO, we have to have a license to be able to do this. Is is actually pump ashore some of the dredge material that we're taking from the, the marinas and things in cows to reuse that then to rebuild the salt marshes mm. so that should have a really positive effect on the environment and the, the, the natural environment in in the river medina what's your own personal agenda looking like what would you hope personally to achieve over the next sort of four or five years so the main thing for me i'm a local boy i live in cows I've, I've got a real interest in the harbour itself, not only from a safety point of view, but just from a... It's a really nice place to be. I love the town, I love the vibrancy, particularly in the summer. It's great seeing all these people out enjoying the boats. So my key thing, actually, is a bit of consistency now and a bit of stability for Cowes Harbour. There's been a bit of turbulence with, with changes of harbour masters since the long-standing Stuart McIntosh left. He did just over 20 years in the role. It, it, it would be nice to think that certainly for the next five ten years we can we can keep the same harbour master the same team we've got a really really good vibrant team in there now with gary as our ceo he's not from the marine world he's airports and and was very successful in running a, a car museum actually up north and and he's a real breath of fresh air not to discount anything Stuart did but he was wearing two hats he was ceo and harbour master gary's got a real focus on the business side of things and he's got a real keen eye on the future of cows harbour what it is we can do to make sure we're here for the next 100 years and further on. He's, he's, he's really keen for us to look at everything with a fresh pair of eyes and say, OK, what can we do in cows? What can we do to make it better? We know historically there's been a shortage of, of births and moorings in cows. We're very limited on space. We can't build any more marinas. There's houses and factories and shipbuilding and all the rest of it. So it's what can we do to eke out any more births, any more facilities to help reduce the waiting lists for places like Shepherds and Cows Yacht Haven and East Cows Marina and try and get some more people in. We're also putting a, a lot of money and thought into bringing young people into the marine industry. So we're running an apprenticeship scheme and we're actually supporting the younger, underprivileged kids from the island, particularly from cows if we can, to get them into the sea change programme with UKSA and give them a taste of what's available out on the water. We're hoping that one or two of those will then go on to maybe off, you know, start an apprenticeship with us or go off to sea and then come back in the future to, to help carry on the, the good name of cows. And take over your job. Hopefully, yeah, if we can get the right one. Yeah, I'm sending my eldest boy off to sea very shortly. Does he yeah. know? Not yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's, he's earmarked for, for 10 years' time to, to come and be the deputy. Captain John Kidd, thank you so very much indeed for joining us today's podcast. No. Thank you for listening to today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please do leave me some feedback, and if you feel so disposed, perhaps rate the show with five stars. Whichever platform you use to listen to your favourite podcasts, if you'd like to hear more from some of my featured, and I think fascinating guests, just search for Kerry Herford-Jones. That's C-E-R-I, Herford-Jones, or Business On Board. Let's catch up again soon.